The Ortho PAC, hosted by Sam Dyer. Welcome to the Ortho PAC, where we discuss up-to-date orthopedic topics for the busy clinician. I invite you to sit back and relax as I attempt to fill in the gaps between education, current events, and real-world practice. All right, welcome back today, Dr. Matthew Hannibal. Dr. Hannibal, thanks for being with us. Well, thank you very much, Sam. We're going to talk about value in healthcare. Uh, Dr. Hannibal is not only a board-certified orthopedic spine surgeon, he also has an MBA. So this topic is, is really not something I've spent a lot of time thinking about, uh, and I know I should. And I'm hoping you can give our listeners a better understanding. When I started researching this, uh, and there's a lot of information out there, a lot of government stuff, I looked up the word value and just came up with some different definitions. And I think the one that seems to fit the best, in my my opinion, or what I read was relative worth, utility, or importance, or a good value at the price. And so thinking about that, I was thinking like my patients think, uh, value in healthcare, am I getting a quality service for the money I spend? And more importantly to me, did I have a good outcome uh, from that service? So with that being said, knowing there are a lot of opinions, uh, Dr. Hannibal, how do you define value-based care? Sure, you're right, it's a loaded question. I think there's three aspects, and you touched on a couple of them when you're thinking about trying to provide healthcare at value. Three, those three are essentially cost and quality. The other is accessibility. So those are the three things. You're trying to achieve high quality care to the most pe- possible people that you can at the lowest possible cost. Obviously, the three of them in concert are hard to achieve. And where value comes in, and when we think of it in terms of an equation, it's quality over cost. The higher the quality, the lower the cost, the, the better the value is. And so that's how I would define it. Now, of course, quality is a loaded term. Um, so next comes, how do you define that? And, and you sort of indicated that maybe outcome is the best qualifier. Um, but outcome is also a difficult one to define. In other words, what a patient feels is the best outcome may not necessarily be the good outcome. If somebody has cancer, they eventually um, die of that diagnosis. Was the treatment you provided from the beginning to the end you know, still a failure of outcome? In other words, did they get the best care that we possibly have at this time or not? Um, and so was providing any care worthwhile or should we have just withheld care because it would have been more valuable? Like those are hard things to answer and it gets into an ethical situation. Um, Really what we're trying to achieve is what we would consider uh, in an uncertain environment where all outcomes, in other words, we don't have cures for for many conditions that we treat. Um, We're just trying to prolong life or ease suffering. And so what is the value of those things? In other words, are we providing the best care we have available at this time? And are we treating the patient for the right indications with the right treatments at the right time? Um, And a lot of those have to be defined by the collective, by a group of physicians. Like what is the best treatment at that time? And then we have to make sure we render it. So that's where it does get very difficult to define. It is. And it was difficult for me researching this. So it's already a difficult concept to define. And now we're putting metrics and outcomes on the measurement of this. And there are several. Uh, I'm, I know that a lot of people are familiar with CMS and MACRA, and that sort of thing. But there are so many other components, physician qualifying reporting initiative, value-based modifier, meaningful use, merit-based incentive program. I mean, it's just you're, you're dying in a sea of acronyms here. Is any of this really improving value for the patient? And if so, how? I think what it boils down to is really providing each patient the, the type of care that they require at the time. And what that means is, are you providing service, or making a referral or ordering a test uh, that is either unnecessary or in some cases harmful? Really, that just comes down to the education of each individual provider and knowing this is the necessary treatment at this moment in time. And you mentioned incentives in some of that. Uh, because some of these programs are incentive-based, obviously. And, and that is one of the huge problems with our healthcare environment is how the incentives are set up because people will make decisions. Uh, we know this economically. They'll make decisions based on incentives. And so things like the MACRA program or the MIPS program are designed saying, 
listen, we're going to take a broad view. We're going to take a 90 day bundle and we're going to say, we'll give you, if you can save money for the government on that, we'll give you a portion of it. And, and so it doesn't say how you do that, but uh, if you do, you'll save money. And so it really doesn't say much about is the patient indicated for a certain procedure or a certain treatment. It only talks to, can you decrease the cost of whatever care you're rendering? And of course, there are incentives in that. There are incentives uh, to not do procedures. There's incentives uh, to basically treat the patient differently than you, you normally would trying to save money. And it becomes difficult to know if you're withholding necessary care would a more expensive treatment be more appropriate for that patient with a better potential outcome? There is that type of incentive. Of course, insurance in general has perverted incentives, um, what we call moral hazard in, in business, where whenever you have a third party payer involved that is going to decidedly you know, pay for a service. So when you will find when people meet their deductibles and they don't have much in the way of copay, they'll increase their frequency of visits to the physician, request tests that maybe they don't need. Frequently happens at the end of a year, right? We see it all the time in practice. People will come in asking for an MRI that, you know, my knee's been hurting for a long time. I, I want to get that MRI. I've met my deductible. Now's a good time for me to get it. That's moral hazard in play, and it increases the cost. So uh, there are incentives that are happening that, that are definitely uh, not in the best interest of saving money and not really in the best interest of the patient and their care. When they have these incentive-based programs, there's so many different things. Doesn't that create like a lot of duplication of the medical record and a lot of paper trail that, that just kind of really, it's just collecting data. I mean, how does that improve value and care? And you're absolutely right, Sam. The, the burden of some of the government programs is their administrative burden as well. So not only duplicating tests because we're not passing that documentation around, even though it's digitized, we are also increasing the amount of non-provider staff and effort that we have to put into getting that data digitized. They began MACRA in the early phases, it was a fairly well-respected program, um, but then as the burden became higher and more costly and they started ratcheting down how much physicians would benefit and groups would benefit from saving money, it became less attractive. And so how much value is it providing is a really good question. I, currently, I'm not sure that it is at all. It's, it's increasing an administrative burden and possibly increasing the cost of healthcare just by what you're saying, which is duplicative tests and uh, duplicative care throughout because of documentation issues. Well, you know, at the end of the day, um, when we're thinking about value in healthcare and, and payments and compliance with the metrics and that sort of thing, how, how do you measure it? I mean, is it something that, you know, you, you really can't define, you use these metrics as a way to say, I think we're giving value, or is it something that you just take good care of the patient? Is that providing value? I think what happens is that there are several aspects to that good care. One is patient satisfaction. How does the patient feel about it? What is their perception about their care? And the same outcome in two different patients can be perceived differently. A lot of that is patient-based, and, and they haven't actually found that even though the patient perception of outcome is something we want to achieve, it's not been actually been well correlated with good care. Uh, that, that is one aspect of it that is going to be included in whatever metric you're creating, but also has to be taken with a grain of salt in that regard. And so really it's, are we giving the patient the best treatment that increases their odds of better functionality and better quality of life? Those are going to be the outcomes that we look for. How do we take this patient's condition, where it is now, and optimize their outcome? And even though it may not be 100%, we can't cure that condition, but if we do this treatment, we've got a 70% chance of making them more functional than they were before. And that's where value, I think, is. In other words, for that cost, does it provide more functionality, a better quality of life than if we didn't provide that treatment or some other treatment? And we're only now beginning to understand which treatments those are because it takes a lot of data to identify those. 
And there are a lot of patient factors that will change based on how old they are and what kind of patient they are, what other uh, comorbidities they may have. One condition may be treated with one uh, treatment and one may be treated with another treatment, but that's because their functionality may differ. And that's where I think it's going with healthcare. It's going to have to be a personalized, individualized treatment program for each patient based on data. Okay. Let me ask you one question. Uh, arthroplasty, someone that does hips and knees. Well, there are different degrees of, you know, failed hips and failed knees uh, that require revision. And it seems like that's going to be a challenge to kind of meet some sort of value when you're working on somebody that already has, for want of a better word, poor uh, protoplasm, you know? So how does that fit? Or does that, is that even a consideration? Yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely something we have to consider. But what you're talking about is the more complicated patients. Right now, there are certain programs, uh, like I was talking about the bundling, where there's another perverse incentive, where if you take on that complicated patient who you know is at risk of being expensive because they have, like you said, poor protoplasm, they may not recover as well as somebody who's more healthy or they have obesity, or they have diabetes, they have risk factors that increase their chances of having a complication, which is going to be more expensive for you, you're now incentivized not to operate on that patient, even though they're the ones who may benefit from having a knee replacement or some other uh, orthopedic treatment. And there are some studies that are suggesting now that it may be the more fragile patients, the ones who are at higher risk, who have the most to gain from some of our interventions as long as they're appropriately evaluated and they can tolerate the procedure, they may benefit the most. We really have to watch you know, how we get in, involved in these more complex procedures and how we get uh, incentivized to take them on. Uh, the bundling program is not gonna work for that. Uh, things like macro and MIPS, because they're incentivizing you not to do that. But if you had a personalized, you say, listen, for this patient with this risk profile, they're most likely going to benefit from this procedure. We're more likely to get them better than if we didn't do it. There's value in that. And so any program that we have going forward is going to have to incentivize that type of care for the right patient. And I think that's where it's going in the future. So that revision knee and hip, maybe not all of them get revisions, but the appropriate ones do. Well, Dr. Hannibal, a confusing subject. I appreciate you coming on and trying to make some sense out of it. So any other thoughts that you have on it? Just one last thought, because I think all the things we've talked about are leading up to, um, you're right, it sounds confusing. How do, you, how do you put all this together? I think what the next 20 years in medicine are going to bring is a couple of innovations, which are, we're already heading that way. In other words, we talked about digitization of healthcare records. We've talked about collecting data and personalizing treatment protocols for individuals based on risk factors and risk profiles. The question is, how do you do all of that? And right now, we're already just bridging the gap where we are, we've got enough data and we're starting to collect the data from these EHR systems where we're using machine learning and artificial intelligence to help us define these personalized treatment protocols. So that's one aspect of the future that is coming, that soon those decisions are gonna be strongly guided by computer algorithms. And they're gonna be much more accurate and much more efficient than, than physicians are at doing it now. The other thing is population health. The value in healthcare, and when we talk about the American healthcare system, it's always said, well, we spend more than anyone else and our outcomes aren't any better. Although it looks on the surface like our healthcare system is probably the most sophisticated in the world, and indeed it, it is. What we miss is the population health aspect. All of our expense goes into care usually after a condition is identified. Whereas if you look at a lot of European countries, they spend a lot more on population health. If you took their population health expense as well as their medical expenses after the uh, condition has been diagnosed, they spend almost as much as the United States. It's just that they break it up differently than we do. And so America needs to spend more money on population health and improving the health of the cohort of Americans in general. And then 
machine learning algorithms and, and artificial intelligence to personalize the care of each individual. When we start to do that, we'll see some true savings in healthcare. And I think you'll see uh, that's where the value comes. Better quality care at a lower cost for all of Americans. You know, it is very interesting to hear you say that as an orthopedic surgeon. Uh, and I'm not saying that to be, uh, to be disrespectful at all. Uh, I think it's fascinating and I think it's awesome. So I'm glad to hear that. I'm, I'm glad you feel that way. I hope others do the same. Yeah. Well, I mean, I have my MBA too, right? So I think of it as a business person. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> right, right. You got to think of it. So, well, Dr. Hannibal, thank you so much. All right, Sam. You have a good day. Thank you for joining the Ortho PAC podcast. Join us for our 21st annual meeting in Nashville, Tennessee, PAOS in the Music City, September the 6th to September the 10th, 2021 at the Omni Nashville Hotel check paos.org for details.